What's up? You're back with Donnie Greens, and this video is going to be an epic video all about the industry's most favorite microgreens trays from Bootstrap Farmer. Now, many of us are using these trays, and I doubt many of us know that much about these trays. I had a lot of questions myself, and luckily I was able to interview the manager at the manufacturing facility where Bootstrap Farmer gets their trays manufactured. Pretty awesome, this is not a video you want to miss because we're gonna be covering in detail and diving deep the manufacturing process, what materials are used to make these trays, the safety of materials, and the safety of these trays in general, right? We're using them for agricultural purposes, we're growing food in them. We wanna know, are these actually food safe? Are these ready to use for growing food and for agricultural purposes? So I was actually lucky enough to be in the manufacturing facility, meet the whole Bootstrap Farmer team, meet the whole team in the manufacturing facility. And in this video, you're gonna see a conversation between me and Cal, who's actually the manager at the facility, and he was just an Awesome dude, such a pleasure to be around. So this video is literally coming direct from the source. And in my opinion, that's a very special video that we should feel lucky to have, right? We actually get to dive in deep on some of this information, learn about the trays, the manufacturing process and all that hands on. So before we jump into this fantastic conversation between me and Cal, I just wanna quickly explain why I was even in the manufacturing facility for Bootstrap Farmer. Like why was I there in the first place, right? So I was actually there with Bootstrap Farmer for a week because we were collaborating on a special product which ended up being these limited edition Donnie Green's Bootstrap Farmer green and gold trays. Now these are the first and only trays to ever be made with two different colors in there. And these are probably the only trays that are ever gonna be manufactured with two colors because it ended up being a very difficult manufacturing process. And uh, basically the manufacturers never wanna do it again because it caused so many issues. So we only printed 19,000 of these trays, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot. These are gonna sell out fast. So if you wanna get your hands on them, I put a link below this video so you can go shop at the Bootstrap Farmer website. So these are the Donnie Greens edition trays green and gold, and we're calling these the gold standard. So again, if you wanna get your hands on these limited edition trays before they sell out, I have a link down below in the description. And if you wanna get your hands on these for free, you can actually join my new challenge called the One Tray Away Challenge. And you can sign up and learn a lot more about that challenge at onetrayaway.com. It's an insane microgreens growing experience with me where I'm gonna be growing step-by-step, side-by-side with you, ensuring that you really master your growing process. It comes with a free kit, so you have all the materials that you need to grow four trays of microgreens, and the first 500 people to sign up for this challenge will actually get these limited edition green and gold trays. This was another huge collaboration, a project that I'm very passionate about, I worked very hard on, and this is a collaboration between me, Bootstrap Farmer, and True Leaf Market. So please, at the very least, go check out the page at onetrayaway.com. I worked super hard on it. So at the very least, please just check it out. It's totally awesome. And if you're gonna join the challenge, you need to get in before registration closes, which is happening very soon. So again, go to onetrayaway.com. All right, let's jump into this epic conversation about Bootstrap Farmer trays. What's going on? I'm Donnie Greens. I'm here with the Bootstrap Farmer team and here with Cal. We are actually in their manufacturing facility because we are working on a collaboration project and we're here in the Midwest. Um, and I've learned so much about the process of how these wonderful trays are made. And it's really cool. I'm learning things that I didn't think I would learn. We're diving deep into certain topics. I've even brought up some stuff that it's like, wait, what, what is that? So, I'm really excited to dive in deep on these trays about the whole process. That way everybody can know a little bit about the process, but also the materials that are in here and how they're perfectly safe for farming and all sorts of different things. We're gonna answer, I'm sure, a bunch of questions that a lot of people have about these trays. So before we get into too many details and before I ask too many questions, why don't we talk about the process and everything, all the work that goes in to making the best trays on the planet. All right, first and foremost, welcome. Uh, We're super excited to have you guys here. Uh, welcome to all your viewers too. I know you've got a crazy, awesome fan base and, and followers on your uh, channel. So 
we'd we'd love to walk through how we make these. You are able to see some of our hurdles that we go through on a daily basis. It's not seen very often um, when you're buying these these parts. Do we want to show this off real quick or do we? All right. So this is a special color compound for Donnie Greens. It's a green base with a gold flake inlay. So you can really see it. We won't be able to see it in here, but really, really pops off in the sun. I think I think you guys were really happy with, with how these turned out. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's the first tray that's being made with multiple colors rather than just like one solid color. And obviously that led to some challenges. It did. It was the curveball for us. We sampled these. We, we noticed some possible issues that could arise down the road. We fixed those. It's been a scramble the last 24 hours. Not a whole lot of sleep, but we, we got it done. We knew you guys were here just for a week. We wanted to make sure that we, we capitalized while you guys were here. So I hope you're happy with them. I hope your, your followers will be happy with them. I'm sure they are. They're bootstrap trays, the best trays on the market. So we'll go ahead and walk through how these are made. We'll start from just receiving raw material. Uh, we talked about in the facility, these are polypropylene trays. Uh, they're high impact resistant uh, propylene. So we, we actually switch from a lesser impact resistant tray to these trays and that's all material based. You got to see how that, that arrives into the plant and the raw beads. It looks like something you'd see in a bean bag chair that you had when you were a kid. Yep, like little airsoft pellets. That's exactly what, yeah. They, yeah, we've probably had some people take them, try it, but <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. So we take those out onto the manufacturing floor. Those are loaded into the machine. We call it through the throat at the top of the machine. That's where all the color and any other additive that we might be putting into these trays are, are added into the process. You saw how the uh, color units dropped in a certain percentage. Everybody's always really fascinated with how little of, of color that you need in order to get a good um, color throughout the entire part. So for instance, on these parts, we actually use less than a percent of, of green color in order to get this base color. And then about 3% on that gold to get it to disperse correctly. And what you, you guys will notice, none of these parts are exactly the same. That's kind of what makes it super cool. So we just kind of let the process, you know, go, it takes, take it where it needs to go. And, um, yeah, you kind of get a little flame look there. So once it's, once it's loaded into the top of the, the machine through the throat, goes into a, uh, the melting process in the screw and barrel. Most of that's done through friction and compression. And about 10 to 15% of that is done through heat. So that barrel's wrapped in super high um, heating components. Um, we're melting, or we're, that, those barrels, barrel heats are around 500 degrees. Every shot, every 30 seconds, we looked at the cycle time, it's about a 30 second cycle, producing two parts at a time. So every 30 seconds, that barrel's uh, charging, we call it charging. So it's loading up material into that barrel, uh, melting it down, and then shooting it into the, the mold. From there, it's, it's held. It takes about two seconds to fill the, the cavities, which is where those are made. And it's surrounded by steel, uh, cooled steel and it's held there for about 25 seconds so about two second cycle to uh two second uh, inject time 25 seconds and then about three seconds to to pull out and put onto the conveyor where we uh, looked at some of the first articles off the press so you, not often do we have our customers there when the first parts are coming off we don't like that necessarily because we want to have all the bugs worked out but Today was special. <laughs> yep. And we were in here last night and I'm just playing around with the tray, like really flexing it way more than I should have been. And then we cracked it right in the corner here in the weak point. And we realized that that was because of the ratio of gold and all that. So it was really funny to have me in here as we're putting out the, the first few and working through those kinks together. Um, but yeah, I was super surprised at the ratio of pellets because it starts off clear. Mm -hmm. So it's all these clear pellets. And then there's like one little speck of green, like one little speck of, of the gold, and then somehow it magically turns into this new color. It's highly concentrated. So if you think about uh, if you're going to color this glass with food coloring, you'd need you know two drops. 
two drops, three drops of food coloring. So it's, it's kind of the same deal. It's very, it's highly concentrated. So you don't have to put a whole lot of it in there. And we, we talked about the contamination process of actually coloring a part uh, because there are, we call them contaminants. They're, they're totally fine. Um, it's just different from what the base material is. So it doesn't like that. So if you have too much, it's going to cause issues. It can cause some degradation down the road. Or if you don't do enough, you're going to get really um, almost a translucent part. So it's a fine line. We dial that in as we go. Usually it takes us, you know, half a day to get that dialed in. This one took a little bit longer for us just because it is new. Quite frankly, the tool isn't built to do this. We've got other parts that are built to do this marbling effect, but like I always tell, tell Bootstrap, we, we'll figure it out for them and, and make it work. So I'm used to getting these trays, you know, 30 at a time. They show up at my door, they're in a box and I'm like, cool, I can grow more microgreens. We're so used to just receiving things in the mail. We don't understand all of the process that goes into some of this stuff. Like we were talking about something as simple as like a little screw is like hours and hours of um, heavy work with engineers and getting everything perfectly dialed in and, and correct. So being able to walk through the actual manufacturing facility, seeing all the raw materials that have to be brought in and that's a cost. And then that all has to get moved to the station and then get loaded up there. And then the colors have to be perfect and all the testing and tasting. Well, not tasting. We're not eating the, eating the stuff. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was it was wicked cool to see the whole process and everything that goes into these. And now it makes sense why they're so amazing and why they're so strong and durable. And it's not a single use plastic. These I've been using over and over and over again, slapping the hell out of them every time, you know, we go through a cycle and they, you know, just don't break. Yeah. And what, what you're seeing even now yeah, and seeing all the work that goes on out there, you're really still only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Uh, this goes back three years that that we were developing and not just the parts, but the relationship that we have with, with Bootstrap. Mm -hmm. So um, the R&D that you're talking about, we, we were talking about like a really small component. The R&D hours that go into that are, I, I, would, I would love to know really what it is. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we're talking days and days and days of R&D work, making sure that when we cut this block of steel, it's going to be exactly what Bootstrap wants and what Bootstrap's customers want. Once you cut it, you're married to it and that's yep. what you've got. So we want to make sure that we do it the right way the first time. So we're not, you know, dealing with revisions because that takes, you know, two, three, four weeks, depending on how intense and, and uh, how big of a change you're trying to to do. Yeah. You, what you're seeing out there, it, it, it is a lot of work and we live in a, in a, in an instant gratification world where it's one click away, everything's one click away. And that's all we expect. We don't think about the things that go on behind the scenes. And you know, that's why we're here. That's job security for us too. We, we like the hard work. We like the long hours and we like having happy customers. So obviously our customers bootstrap, but it's, you know, if their customers aren't happy, Bootstrap's not happy. So we always aim to please those guys right there. And they've done a fantastic job. They've created some incredible products and continue continue to do so. Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about this big like steel block, it's called tooling for those of you who don't really understand the manufacturing process. I know a little bit about this because um, I ended up walking walking down the line of getting a few patents for a sprouter that I want to develop. And then once I started learning about the manufacturing process, I was like, all right, I need a few years to save up for this tooling. So it's a big old block of steel and they're like carving it out and everything has to be perfect because every little hole, every little line, all of it, the logo, everything made in the USA, that all has to be perfectly, really perfectly made. And that's what the tooling is for. So if the tooling isn't made perfectly that, that first time, hopefully you can edit the tooling, but the tooling costs tens of thousands of dollars just to be able to make the trays. That's not even the material cost. So yeah, a lot of time, a lot of cost goes into this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, the the cuts are one thing, but you've got all the water lines and everything. I mean, really comes down to the details and and uh, making sure that we we create a as perfect of a tool as we can because that makes our 
production go a lot smoother. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, and it it is a big thing. I mean, I've like I told you, I know a lot of our customers. I have pulled out second mortgages to pay for some of the stuff to get their business up and rolling. So yeah, we are we're talking high dollar stuff here. It's a lot of investment, not just time, financially as well. Yeah. So all right, I think we covered the process pretty well. Um, I think plastic has a really bad stigma. Um, you know, we've seen the turtles with the straw stuck in, in its nose. Um, and unfortunately that is an aspect of plastics, but when we talk about these bootstrap farmer trays, like these are not single use plastics and that's the whole point, you know, like these trays are made to be super sturdy so you can use them over and over again. I remember when I first started my business. I was working with a local greenhouse distribution company and just buying whatever trays I could get. They were the tall ones and they were just very flimsy and cheap. So what ended up happening is what a lot of my greens farmers like to call it a tray graveyard. So I had these stacks of just broken trays just like right down the line that are just useless for me now. And I don't even think those are recyclable. So they may or may not be. I'm not I believe really. those are PET. They would be recyclable. It'd so be maybe. something like you'd, you'd see in those cheap water bottles. Okay. But still, I mean, if you're getting one use out of them, the, that's not sustainable. Yeah, not, not at just all. not just from an environmental standpoint, but from an ownership standpoint, business standpoint. Because now you're spending money and and creating a new cost of goods sold for yourself. Meanwhile, you can be investing in an asset that will last years over and over again. Yeah, a good analogy of, of this would be the tooling to make this right. So you spend more money up front, and you get a better tool. And the trays are your tools and you, you can use it a lot longer. Exactly. So I hated, I hated trays breaking. I hated having to, oh, I can't imagine. Toss them. I ended up donating a bunch because they thought that they could use them at, you know, some uh, educational place nearby. So that was cool and all, but I made sure to switch over all my trays as quick as possible to bootstrap farmer trays. That is a big aspect of plastics that it's just, that's not a downside with these. Like these are not ending up in the ocean. Like we're never going to see a tray, a bootstrap armor tray, just like landing on a beach. No, you know but I, I bet it works if you did find one. Yeah. I feel like we could make this into like a raft or something. We should string a bunch of these together and like try to sail across, you know, a pond or something. Maybe we'll start and then maybe we'll take it in the ocean. But, um, but yeah, that's something I feel really good about too. Because not yeah, like we said, not only are these going to last me forever and be a real asset to my business, but I never have to worry about the environmental impact of these because they are not a single use plastic. They are multi-use. Yeah. It, it's a constant battle in our industry um, to fight that stigma. It, it, it's tough. And it's something I'm passionate about because and what we talked about on the floor was, all right, so when it comes to efficiencies and reusing as much as we can, like we don't want our plastic ending up in the dumpster. That's just throwing cash away. That's throwing dollars out the window and we'll never be able to use it again. So our number one goal is to have 0% and it'll never happen. I mean, you know, we spill plastic, we have stuff that if it gets contaminated, we can't use it. Our number one goal is to be as efficient as possible, use as much material, material as we can and get it out the door to, uh, to our consumers. But it is, it is interesting how plastic, and I understand, you know, when you drive down the road, you're not looking at, at steel plates sitting on the side of the road. It's usually plastic. It's usually plastic bags, straws, um, water bottles. But, you know, is that plastic's fault or is that the people throwing it out's fault? Yeah. Um, there are ways to recycle. There's, uh, we're, we're, we're getting better. We're a little bit behind uh, from Europe. Europe's really good at their recycling programs. They've come up with ways to actually burn plastic at such a high heat that it doesn't cause any emissions. Mm -hmm. um, they've they've, they've done, a, done a fantastic job. The problem is, is there's not a ton of money there, but it costs so much to get it up and going. Right. So it's a it's a balancing act and really when it comes down to it it's probably a government's issue and europe's willing to spend that money and and we aren't over here right now so yeah um but yes we we hear those things we understand them but if you talk to anybody in the plastics industry that's doing anything like we are the last thing they want to do is throw stuff out on the side of the street or into the dumpster because it's just lost profit. And that was another thing that surprised me was part of the process is you have some trays that 
you know, have like a little bit of a defect, mm -hmm. if you will. So there's like a stack of trees in there that were the defective ones. And you were saying that you're going to turn those back into black trees. And I'm thinking to myself, how the heck are you going to do that? Those look like they would glow in the dark. They're like neon green. <laughs> but then, um, you know, obviously in learning about the pellets, the blank, you know, clear pellets, and then that tiny bit of color now makes a lot of sense. Because this, even though it looks like it's 100% green, it's actually like 0.9% green. Yeah. So it's wicked cool because then you just add in more black and now you can turn this into a black tray. You would never even know that. Yeah, we love or, we love black color because it covers everything up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, a, you know, and, and most of our volume with Bootstrap is black. So what we do is just grind those up. You saw the big grinders. Uh, you could throw, you know, some extremely large parts in there. So, you know, you saw that palette of, of uh, trays out there we can grind that down in about an hour. So we save them up, get to like where we've got like a half day's worth of grinding, grind it all down, and then uh, have it sitting there for the next run of black trays. Uh, we overcolor it with about a half percent more black to make sure that we cover up all those those different colors in there. And it's it's off and rolling. So we consider that generation, uh, first generation regrind which is really, really clean stuff too. So there's very little contamination. Any contamination that you would see in that would be maybe some dust particles, but it'd be so minor and nominal that you wouldn't see it in the final product. One aspect that I asked in the warehouse, um, I was asking like, can I recycle these? I never even really looked around on the tray to see if there's one of those little recycling numbers. But over here in the corner, where is it? On the bottom? It's number Where was five. Thing? Um, I think it's right there. Yep, right there. Cool. Yeah, so that little number five, we can recycle these. So even if it was past due or you used them 100,000 times and they did finally break, um, these can then be recycled and turned back into another product. So that's a little different of a process, recycling you know, into a post-consumer recycled plastic product versus taking kind of like your raw materials that were just made and then grinding them back down. So what is the difference between those two processes? Yeah. Well, the post-consumer, it actually has to go through an entire manufacturing process itself. So it has to be cleaned, first of all. It has to be separated. So that's why you have the number fives on there. If, if the parts have it, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll be able to sort those out pretty much uh, you know, 90% or so. And then it'll go through uh, multiple washings um, and they've got a process there where it separates out through densities of the plastic. From there, it's ground down and repelletized. So what you're seeing, the, the parts that we grind up are not pelletized. They're just chunked up. So when you get it repelletized, it's just easier to feed into machines. You can use it on different, this is a little bit more technical, but different types of runners. So. Um, normally with the re regrind that we use, we only use it in cold runners only because it's, it's not a consistent pellet size. So with that industrial repelletization, um, reprocess material, uh, they'll usually compound that. We've talked about some of the other fillers out there that, that, uh, that we use like that polyethylene, the glass filled polyethylene that we use, that would be something that you would see that's repelletized and reprocessed from post-consumer or post-industrial. It's a completely different process. Um, ours is all done in-house. That stuff, you know, they're huge manufacturing plants. We've got one uh, you know, a few miles away from us that we actually use some of their products on. Yeah. So what I'm hearing here is like post-consumer recycling is like much more in-depth, much more sorting. Mm -hmm. Then after it's grinded, it then has to be repelletized. Mm -hmm. So just like a lot more. So it's actually extruded and then pelletized. So, yeah. um, which is basically the first part of our process. So if you took our, if you took the mold away from, from our machine and just um, basically squirted plastic, that's what extrusion would be. Yeah. Um, and then it's cut. And it's cooled and then cut into tiny little pieces. And that's what you see out there in the boxes. Cool. Well, then in this case here, like there's no transportation because it's already here. Correct. And then you're grinding it here on site. Correct. And then you're not even doing that repelletization because you don't need to. Right. Yep. It's we awesome. just blend it in at a certain percentage level. Um, 
And then the other thing too, that's really important is the FDA aspect of this. So when you, when you buy uh, reprocess, it's really hard to get that FDA stamp. And that's a very important thing for bootstrap is to make sure that these micrograin trays are FDA approved materials. Right. Cause I mean, we're growing food in them. Correct. So that's obviously a concern. And that was one of my concerns in, in, uh, in there when we were talking before is, you know, like the BPA, the BPS, those type of things in the plastic. And I wasn't even thinking about FDA approvals or stamps. Um, but that's how we got into it. So tell me about that. Is there any BPA in here? Is there any BPS? No, sir. Nope. It is fully FDA approved. Um, you know, stuff and we, we talked about off gassing. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, so anytime you see BPA, you're going to see that in like a PVC, which is extremely toxic. Um, and then, you know, you've got, uh, BPS, which is in polycarbonate which is in order to, for them to say BPA free, they used its cousin BPS. Mm -hmm. So um, still, still an FDA friendly uh, material, but um, you know, if, if God forbid something catches on fire or it's burning, it's sitting on a hot stove, you know, the toxicity of that smoke could be bad to inhale. Yeah. So well, I mean, burning plastic is a whole different story. Yeah. Way. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend anybody huffing burning <clears throat> plastic. So not only are these trays BPA free, BPS free, but they're FDA approved. And even further than that FDA approval of this product, everything that you guys bring into this facility, I was also under the impression is also FDA approved. For Bootstrap, yes. For some of our other customers, not everything is. But for everything on Bootstrap, uh, we have certificates going back for three years that we require our suppliers to to give us every time we bring a load in. So, yep. um, yeah, if, if for any reason that Bootstrap said, hey, uh, this lot number that was ran at this month, this day, uh, can you give me the certificates for that? We can, we can pull those up. So... Uh, that was number one when we first started talking uh, material changes. That was the first question they asked. Is it FDA? Yes, it's FDA. Absolutely. Uh, food contact friendly. Polypropylene is one of the cleanest materials out there. Uh, we talk about olefin families. So polyethylene, polypropylene. Uh, polyethylene is, you know, that's medical grade stuff. Like when you, when you get a, uh, knee replacement. They're they're putting in polyethylene blocks in your knee. And that's what these are made out of? This is polypropylene, but they're like this. I mean, they're very, very, very close. The only thing, that, the only difference there is like the mechanical properties. Polypropylene's a little bit uh, stronger. Polyethylene's got a little bit more, uh, um, it's a little bit more lubricious. So it's slippery. And that's why they like it in, in those those knees. So, so that olefin family, like for instance, the... Uh, the coverings that, that Bootstrap uses, that's that's polyethylene. So. For the greenhouses? Correct. Cool. That's Correct. awesome. So you're using all just clean materials across the whole board for Bootstrap Farmer products? Yep. And they also happen to be really good in UV. So nice. it's like somebody made this material specifically for this application. That definitely helps. I don't want these sparkles fading away. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't. No, no. They're, uh, they're beautiful trays. Very cool. One part of your process... That reminded me so much of, of farming and such a similar thing is the traceability aspect because you have those documents that trace back multiple years. We have a similar thing in farming just in case somebody, you know, gets sick and they think it might have come from the microgreens. Um, you know, you always want to know one step up, you know, who you got your seeds and all your materials from. And then you want to know one step down who you sold that product from. And then if you know one step up and one step down, then theoretically you should be able to trace all the way back and see where the source of that problem was. So very similar in the agriculture world and the manufacturing world. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, quality control. And that that's really important to us. Anytime we get a call from Bootstrap because you know things do slip through every once in a while, it's hard to catch every little short shot that, that might, be, uh, might be on the stacks that are coming down those conveyors. You still got a little bit of human error there. Uh, one thing we always ask, what's the lot number and where did it, you know, what, what day was it ran? So yeah. unfortunately, a lot of times that, that isn't caught because by the time the consumer really notices it, they've already recycled the box. So 
But uh, if it is a big concern or a big oopsie, we've got that quality control in place and we can go back and say, all right, what happened here? Was it a process issue? Was it an operator issue? Um, and then we fix it, we document it, and we make sure that it doesn't happen again. Yeah. So. And again, just going back to all those intricacies of the process. Yeah. Um, and every day we have more because <laughs> <laughs> like I said, it's, it's because Donnie uh, Greens wants to put two colors in his tree. <laughs> yeah. I was just talking to my plant manager about that. He's like, all right, I got a file. I go, man, that's usually six months down the road. We got that much going on there. So, uh, it was well documented. You know what? It's good for us. Cause it's another process that we've gotten in the back of our, um, in our back pocket. So we enjoy these types of challenges because one, they end up really cool. And two, it makes us better um, going down the road. So yeah, we, we really enjoyed this one. Well, I'm happy to help you out there. Hey. <laughs> Next one. Let's uh, let's go with black. <laughs> black? Donnie green's black. Donnie green's I'll, black. I'll, yeah, I'll make sure it's a different black than we use. <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing that we didn't talk about, which was like my biggest concern with the product and using plastics is off-gassing. And we've done some even research just today to even dive in deeper. Uh, we learned a ton about off-gassing. But what I was super pumped about is if I can smell a product, like even if it isn't technically off-gassing, like I just feel like something's wrong here. There's a chemical on it or just really nasty, right? Um, smell is just such a good indicator of things. And when these came off the line, like literally I watched it get pressed. It came up with those little suction cuppy things. It got dropped on the tray. You fished it out <laughs> and it was literally still warm. I was like cuddling with it, but I smelled it. Fresh off the press, there's zero smell, like zero. And that was just something that made me really happy and really comfortable because, you know, I tell people to use this product and right. I love the product myself. Um, but I feel somewhat of a responsibility if I'm recommending a product, right, to people, and especially if I'm making a kickback on it or a commission. So that was one thing that made me extremely, extremely happy was there's zero smell like at all whatsoever with these. Right. Yeah, it, it, I, I understand that concern. And, and when we talk about off-gassing, like I told you, uh, polypropylene is about the safest material out there. There's some really some really highly engineered, like a peak um, that they use in aerospace a lot, um, building Tesla rockets and everything else that, that might be a little bit safer. Um, but as far as commodity resins, polypropylene is the best one out there. Uh, so when it comes to off-gassing, I have, I have seen some things in um, like the fiber world like uh, fibrous carpets or or mattresses that's where the off-gassing is is really talked about when we were watching this run i was telling you about all the venting that we need because when it hits a certain heat level it is going to off-gas it, it is going to gas up and that's an important thing for us to know from a tooling aspect of where that gas is is wanting to escape to mm -hmm. so if you look on the backs of these we talked about all those little ribs or lines that you can feel at the bottom. Yeah. That's all vents. And that, that is because that is the last place to fill. And that's where all the gas is, is going to, is going to be uh, trapped at. So, yeah. So you don't want them in the material. Cause that, what would that create bubbles? <clears throat> well, no, it just, it wouldn't fill. So it would burn. It would actually burn. It would compress mm. to the point where it combusts. And it's not like an explosion by any means, but it, it actually burns the plastic. It'll degrade it. It'll look black. It's just not mm. a good looking part. Okay. Um, and a lot of times you'll just have voids there. So we put vents in there. We've got venting all around here. So gassing from, from the manufacturing process is a normal thing. Um, we're obviously well ventilated. I don't think you went in there and was or like, oh my God, what does that smell? So I mean, you could smell it a little bit. I mean, but you're in a plastic, a plastic manufacturing. Plant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's other other stuff that we use in that facility that that smells similar to this too. So like the hydraulic oil that we use on the presses. Um, so yes, if you burn these trays, it's gonna gas. Uh, but it has to hit a certain melting or 
really a melting point, which is 320 degrees um, before it starts smoking and, and creating that, that toxic gas. But even polypropylene um, really isn't that toxic. I, again, would not recommend anybody huffing polypropylene uh, smoke, but you know, like a polycarbonate, if, you know, if that's smoking up, yes, that's a problem. PVC, get out. Like it's, that is not good. This is about the safest material on the market from a cost perspective and just overall um, from a toxicity level that, that you can find. Yeah, that definitely gives me peace of mind as a farmer. And the other thing you mentioned was, was the leaching aspect of it. So we talked about that and I, I actually did some deep dive research quickly um, and uh, I know it does not leach, but I wanted to see, all right, what can cause leaching? And it's pretty intense. So it has to sit um, with something super acidic. We talked like lemon juice, like a, a really highly acidic uh, juice of some sort, because we were talking water bottles at the time. Um, it's got to sit in there for a really long time uh, with sun exposure and everything else. So like I said to you, if you got some acidic soil that's taken some some chemicals out of your polypropylene trays you're probably not growing much anyway yeah if you're using soil that's melting your trees i would just switch to a different soil <laughs> product that's my recommendation or a new job <laughs> yeah, or, or, or a new career path might be suited for you <laughs> so cool i mean that's everything i could think of it was so cool meeting you guys and seeing the whole process because i know how much goes into this stuff yeah, I hope you can understand and, and it gives you a little bit more of an understanding of, of what all goes here. I, I don't like people seeing our struggles, but, um, you know, it's it's good for somebody like you to understand what what goes on here and, and the work that we put in. Um, not me necessarily, but the people out on the floor that are busting their hump to, to make mm -hmm. sure that you got a product that you're going to enjoy. Yeah. So um, that's always good. It's 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 messy, but such as life and manufacturing is above that. So yeah. if you're in the manufacturing world, just expect bumps and bruises along the way and we get there. That's all that matters. Cool. Love it. Now we, we really enjoyed having you here. Um, I really hope you enjoyed it. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Always. Thanks again for watching this video, guys. I hope it was super useful for you. I hope you learned a ton of information about these trays, everything that goes into them. And again, if you wanna buy them, just click that link in the description below. And also, if you wanna get your hands on those for free in the challenge, join the One Tray Away Challenge at onetrayaway.com. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.